Good to have you back for another episode, which happens to be our 236 of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. We're broadcasting live once again from two very apart locations in the world, which is with our mid-century modern master, Ron Lindgren, back in his Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron. Hello, everyone. I'm sort of taking DeSoto and Brown's place today, who is taking care of his centenarian mother. Uh, and I'm very happy to be back in, in front of this audience again. Yeah, thank you very much. Good to have you, young boy, back. Ron, good to have you back. And uh, me, uh, your co-host, Martin Despang, when you wish so, uh, broadcasting live from near Munich, Germany. Um, can we bring the first slide up, um, which is on a very kind of a touchy note, because this is our spring break edition, as the article at the top left uh, points out, as Hawaiian News Now reported some 10 days ago, that while uh, overshadowed by that tragic war in the Ukraine, uh, it makes us almost forget that there was another tragedy, which is still ongoing, which is COVID. But since uh, the restrictions are e get eased, as one is now reports, that will basically help to flock, have a tourist flock in again. But even in Hawaii News Now, at the bottom, you see the next article, uh, we're all over the Ukraine. And how is this, besides you know, the tragic losses of life of innocent people, uh, civilians and children and women, um, and man, um, what does it have to do with architecture a lot as well, because on the right side of that slide, uh, let's try that uh, weekly uh, lesson of German and just uh, limit it to not your whole sentence, but that one word. So what do you think means whole house, Ron? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> my German is, is much lacking. I'll leave that to you, sir. It's okay. So I help you out. So house is house is the same. And hoch means high. So it's a high ah. house. So it's a high building. We call these high rises. And uh, this was from two days ago here on the German news uh, broadcasting NTV, where they were reporting that um, they were hitting uh, this residential high rise here. And I think now, tragically, two days later, I think that high rise basically was, was taken down. Uh, by these, uh, by this missile attack, which is uh, utmost tragic, um, and even we don't even know what what else to say and how can we get the angle back to uh, paradise in Honolulu. But we want to and we have to. And let's get the next slide up um, because uh, Ron, um, you and I and Desoto, we have been um, you know spotting the most recent developments in high-rise uh, condominium uh, development in the last uh, couple of shows, as there was the Lilia in Waikiki, the most recent residential high-rise rental, and then there was after that was the Kuula by GD Gang which is uh, for sale, the units are for sale. So we see them as show quotes at the very top right. And now we promise we wanna move on to another part of town. But before we do that, Ron, um, you also, um, uh, you know, having a, a, a large body of work in hospitality design all over the world, but you also went up high, right? Let's recall how high you went in Waikiki with the uh, with your uh, you know uh, Halikolani and the Halapuna. How many stories were they? Yeah, I'm I'm certainly not a high rise uh, architect, but in my hotel designs, especially in terms of Halikolani and the sister hotel Halipuna, uh, many people there in uh, uh, in Waikiki might be surprised to know that. There is a 22nd floor on the at the Halekalani. It happens to be an elevator room, and across the street uh, at the the Halepuna, the uh, uppermost floor is a 26th floor. So uh, yeah, I've had some experience getting people up in the sky and giving them views uh, to ride home about. Yeah, and adding to your expertise uh, experience, Ron, is that your friend and, and boss and partner, business partner, Edward Killingsworth, 
uh, was residing in one of the best examples of residential high rise, and you were a frequent visitor there, right? And stayed there, right? Yeah, Harbor Square, which we've covered in several programs in the past, is a, a quite uh, compact urban development of two residential towers, all about the same size, and definitely uh, high rise living right downtown in Honolulu. Yeah. And you haven't been a co host on the previous show, and that adding to that experience. That made you actually sit down and write some reflective notes on what do you think the recent developments in Honolulu are. And um, I think we should dig these out. And can you read your notes to us, please, and share them with us? Yeah, especially when I see the second slide, which shows so many high rise glassy prisms in the sky, uh, both uh, condominiums and office buildings, no doubt all clustered together, uh, it, it did make me think of something that I'd written down myself a, a, some time ago about my reaction to that sort of glassiness in the sky uh, in, a, in tropical uh, Hawaii. And so with apologies to the listeners, I'll, I'll basically have to sort of read these old notes. These glassy high-rise housing towers require, in my mind, little design attention from architects. The appearance of the towers is rather in the hands of engineers who work for curtain wall manufacturers. They are purveyors of perfectly impermeable glass skins. This is an amazing uh, engineering uh, feat, when you, especially when you combine it with total air conditioning systems, but it is an architecture. And certainly architects' aesthetic design attention isn't much needed when you've got these vast flat expanses of glass that are a sort of a graph paper in the sky, which basically just sort of delineate where the floor, floor, uh, floors occur and where the, the interior walls beat the outside glass. Characterless, scaleless, shadowless glass towers. Where is the architecture? And I'm, uh, I'm looking again at that second slide of so many of those glass towers. Uh, I, I guess the dubious accomplishment that I think that property developers have done, not just in Hawaii, of course, it's, it's, a, world, it's a worldwide problem, but they have learned how to build giant refrigerators in which people are sort of tightly sequestered together on the shelves of the refrigerator. Now I contend that housing either on the ground or on the sky, the kind of housing that people want and they're hungry for is to be able to secure an identifiable and loved home sanctuary, either uh, by looking at a tall building and, and recognizing that that's their unit, or of course, living on the ground. But the tough and critical questions of creating humane high-rise housing in Hawaii or anywhere in the world they're simply being ignored. Martin and DeSoto have called these out. Here they are again. Energy efficiency, responsiveness to climate and to the detrimental effects of climate change, an outdoor engagement with the benign tropical setting, a possibility of actually having urban gardens in the sky, which are indeed possible, affordability, and the possibility that someone could actually develop a sincere pride in all sectors of Hawaiian society as to how they have come to be so humanely and comfortably housed in paradise. Now these, uh, are, are there really some handsome living quarters scattered about amongst these glass high rises? Of course, but that again, isn't the purview of architects in my mind, but rather that of the develops, developers, interior designers and advertisers. Uh, that sort of serious and all-consuming housing lust that everyone falls prey to, I think in the United States especially, in humans, is engendered with those extravagant advertising depictions of residential luxury in the sky. It's personified by such things that have become must-haves, like marble countertops, rain shower heads, double ovens, wine coolers, and lavish home entertainment systems. So. I still contend that developers, 
curtain wall manufacturers and interior designers are together creating these vast urban residential refrigerators with the least involvement of pesky architects as possible. This, of course, is not just in Honolulu or Hawaii, but that's a worldwide housing reality. And that is my comments on some notes from some months ago. Yeah, and they're still pretty current and uh, giving it the benefit of doubt, of course, we will hope that the ones that we will now uh, in these uh, several volumes uh, of, of this show here, uh, that they will make a difference um, and not be like the satirical cartoon at the very top left basically applies as being sort of greenwashed. What makes us curious, however, is this is a watercolor technique they use for the towers. And so, and they're in between blue and green. So the question will be, are they just green washed or at all or what? And, uh, but just before the show, when we talked about it, Ron, it, it also brought back another memory of yours or, or thought that has to do with something that has to do with the revenge of nature and a creature. Share that, please. Again, when I see the second photograph, this broad view, of so many of these sort of scaleless and inhumane looking glass prisms, I could almost imagine Godzilla having waded out of the ocean from the right, uh, comes into this area, looks around him, he's blinded by the sun blaring off of it, and he gets angry enough to lean on them enough to knock them all down. Uh, and Godzilla, from the early 50s, when he made his first appearance in a Japanese film, uh, has become a symbol of nature's revenge. Uh, in, at that time, it was mostly revenge for the threat of nuclear uh, annihilation of the human race. Now it's a man-made potential sixth extinction event caused by humans directly that might bring Godzilla to Hawaii to sort of clean up the mess of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And another thought we have to have uh, had is has to do with your friend and colleague, Mr. Fitzgerald. Share these as well. Yeah, again, I, I feel sort of hopeless there looking at that second slide. But my good friend helped me to uh, Photoshop away some things uh, so that I could make some points about livability and, and so forth in hotel rooms. If that same friend took Diamond Head off of the upper right of that picture and took the slopes uh, of the mountains to the upper left away, again, that could, be, uh, that could be a portion of Chicago and that could be uh, Lake Michigan to the right rather than the Pacific Ocean. Here is yeah. almost a complete denying of tropical Hawaiian paradise. Yeah, and talking Chicago and the Midwest, where you're from, and I call it my home away from home in Nebraska, we know this very well, that at this time of the year, you were just sharing with me the two places you would love to be the most at this time of the year, which is not uh, where you're from, symptomatically. But at that time of the year, this glass would make sense because it basically could help to harvest as a solar game. But there is no such thing in Hawaii because that sun that will always be our friend, but it's sort of in our face and in, in, our, in our comfort zone, so to speak. And we try to stay away from it as much as we can and shade ourselves uh, and shelter ourselves from it that way. OK, so um, we will, as you see up there uh, as the uh, link to this, where this uh, where we got this picture from, this area, the people here call this uh, Midtown Ala Moana, New Kaka'ako. And that makes us more curious. It makes us go to the next slide. And this is from their website. And uh, this is around the mall area that we dedicated a show to a long time ago to Soto and I at the top right that you might want to revisit. And sort of what makes you really curious is that what we associate the most with Alamoana 
in being the most innovative, and we continue to dwell upon, upon that, which is the Alamoana building from 1961. Just in the last show, this sort of was reiterating the level of innovation and the bioclimatic kineticness of that building that has sort of a feather, uh, you know, a shading feather skin, um, feather cape skin that kept the building cool by these louvers that were basically following the sun and always, uh, again, keeping the glass behind and shade. And almost ironically, intentionally, or just coincidentally, we don't know, uh, they covered that building with their big round logo of Midtown. So what is that about? You're wondering. And let's get us to the next slide. And because they're hiding it from us, we want to not. And so here is, again, the building we're talking about. Uh, very top right is the show quote from way back. And you see in the middle top, you see these operable louvers that they unfortunately stole away from it somewhere in the early 90s. Shame on them. Uh, what we also see here at the very left, top left, is uh, the uh, related exhibit that Bundit Kanistakon dedicated to it in the architectural school's Shen Gallery, because Alfred Yi was the, as for many and most of the buildings uh, of innovative kind, as he's been working with you a lot, Ron, as well. And for the uh, Kahala apartments, for example, he was the structural engineer, and there was even uh, Ed and Al did a spec project together that we did a show about, right? Which was the seashore apartment, which they now rebranded. I forgot what, because it was so kind of silly, but doesn't matter, it's on seaside. <laughs> that was a spec project Ed and uh, Al basically did together. This project here was Al with uh, John Graham, America's most commercial architect at its time. Uh, not a boutique architect, how you would call all these hotshot guys who are chosen to design these exquisite high rises, but basically America's most commercial architect who did uh, a good job. And up to this day, the, the project at the very bottom where we overlaid the Dokomomo uh, uh, Hawaii uh, uh, you know, logo that um, you were a keynote speaker at our national symposium, still is still looking pretty mighty good you know the breeze blocks are coming back and so there is renaissance of breeze block the fine detailing this is really america at its best and that is you know the tradition of that area so let's see how that tradition was respected or was um, basically continued to be written and let's go to the next slide for that and maybe both of us share in what we see and how do we how do we think about what we and I have to upfront because you know I only provide you the picture, Ron, uh, and so you weren't there with me when I was taking this picture, but you're probably you know happy and say, oh, there is this piece of grass down there on the ground that might be helping uh, to fight uh, what we call heat island effect in the city when everything is asphalted and it radiates back. But I have to disappoint you because this is not grass. This is turf of astro nature, astro turf, which is plastic <laughs> slash petroleum. So this is very, very ironic because this would actually catch the just the rain because you know it's open to the skies. However, at the at the back of it, behind it, there's something mounted to the overhang of this big sort of four corsair or patio or whatever you want to call that. And this is one of these, uh, uh, you know, fancy um, uh, in style these days, green walls, which is basically an, an artificial system. This is like you're in the, in the emergency room, right? And you're hooked up to the machines and that one keeps you, keeps you alive. That's how this system is. And that's its only way because that one doesn't get ever any drop of rain. So that's um, pretty ironic, isn't it? Yeah, the fact that uh, the rain, if that were grass, obviously, uh, the rain could percolate through it, get to the soil, uh, but, but now it just rains and pours off onto the concrete, which pours off into the sewage system, which pours off into the ocean, carrying God knows what with it. Exactly, microplastic particles from its plastic <laughs> nature, right? 
So if we if we do a little bit more detective work at the very upper right corner of that image uh, is something that we see up closer on the next image and the next slide. And that's something we don't want to see these days anymore. This is a grill uh, event for what we have to assume a single wall unit fossil AC behind. And we would have thought this is something from the past. And while obviously we're you know, even more disliking the ones that they just bolt and attach to facades, but here going through this effort of having these glass curtain manufacturers that you were so perfectly elaborated on uh, just before Ron and charging them to put the sort of this panel into, into their facade that there is nothing but fossil fuel being burned to cool down, uh, basically refrigerate that otherwise microwave behind is pretty outdated, right? We shouldn't have these anymore these days at all. So if we go to the next slide, this shows us how the building is uh, comprised and composed. The image, the left image is basically the elevation, the only elevation where nothing but glass would be okay, or well, of course, the sun comes around, you know, even, even to that one, but only for a little bit at the very early morning, at the very late afternoon, but otherwise it's totally in its own shade because it's north. But we see here where they could have afforded nothing but glass, there's this middle part, which assumingly is the end of the corridor and maybe the elevator shaft. So they're basically missing out on that opportunity to actually open up to where you could and should open up while the elevation on the right side there is then the opposite one is the southern elevation uh, that's facing uh, the, uh, the facing uh, Mackay the ocean and let's go to the next slide and look at that one a little bit closer what do we have right we have largely what you've been getting at nothing but glass right flush glass that is we don't see any or hardly any operable function maybe there's some little awning function there but it's marginal that won't bring enough airflow through and the only sort of tropical exotic we see there is at the very top left right these are lanai's and these basically facing south they do some shading and they're good but I mean, what are they? Like a, a, a fourth of the facade or even less? And the other stuff is just brutally uh, exposed to the, to the sun, to the pretty uh, you know, harsh sun in Hawaii. Next slide. You, you, you get more of these lanais, which we promote and foster, but you get them to at the wrong facade because this is facing west. And this is where the sun is so low. And that's why we say in bioclimatics or so emerging generation 101 to the east and the west, you want to have vertical shading that ideally is sort of tilted towards the north. So the west sun is being kind of kept out while um, basically the view and the daylight um, uh, you know, um, maximization is being kept. So here you got the lanais. Yes, you got probably 50% of that facade is comprised of lanais. That's a good thing. But unfortunately, they are on the wrong side. And also something we were criticizing over and over again, it's just last week with the uh, Kula again, there's glass guardrails. And glass gar guardrails are just you know making you hot on the lanai. And the, la the lanai should be the cool place, the place that cools you down. So uh, no need and no place for glass guardrails. Uh, let's go to the next slide, uh, which is showing uh, in these four uh, show quote references at the top there, uh, which from a show way back, which we, uh, the sort of the working title was the proletarian power of people's parking plinths where we said, in some ways, actually, the cars are treated nicer than people because they always throw something over, uh, you know, the, the parking stalls as the fenestration, some grills, some vegetation. 
So it's actually more bioclimatically cooled for the cars than for the people. And we see this here in this building again at the bottom. You basically see up there where the cars are, there are these perforated screens and grills. The breeze can go through and it's comfortable, while down there, where's the fixed glazing, you don't want to be behind that when we don't get any of that gas or oil from Putin anymore, which is the point these days, right? So next slide. Huh. Once again, the irony being that this here might actually be the, the best dwelling part of the building, which is not intended to be for the people, it's for the cars. But if it's up to me, or if again, if you turn uh, down the, the oil supply, the gas supply, which is happening now as one of the side effects and sort of in the center of the whole nasty war, then this is the place to be. And that's quite ironic, right? So uh, we can go to the next slide, please. And uh, we got a, only a few minutes left, but we want to move on because this show has to feature quite some of these uh, characters here. And the next one is actually just down the same road, which is Kamoko Street, which is where the Walmart is on the other side. So this one here is just breaking ground. And as you can tell down there from us pulling this from the website, it's called the park. And in fact, we see a little bit of green patch there at the base of the model. We hope this is not AstroTurf, of course. We hope this is, this is real grass. But if you would call it a park, I don't know. We have to wait and to see. But the buildings pretty much look awfully familiar, right? They pretty much look not that much different than the one before. And one of the issues, Ron, you, uh, you, uh, you pointed your, your finger at verbally, um, rightly so, um, in, your, <clears throat> in your writing that you read to us was affordability being a big issue, right? And here we're quoting basically the, the price text of the units, and they don't seem to be uh, affordable at all. So this seems to be all about gentrification. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, regardless and nevertheless, we have to continue and observe more and investigate more and hopefully find positive things uh, along the lines and uh, more buildings. So uh, we will do that. Hope to have you back, uh, Ron, next week for that and also having the Soto back. So it's going to be the three from the the post-fossil filling station then uh, for us reconvening. And uh, until then, uh, please all stay tropically exotic and exotically tropic and safe and peaceful. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.